Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Stories Out of Time and Space. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and at the moment I'm not actually joined by Julian Darius. We're going to be continuing our little mini uh, soiree into the past. Yes, Julian will be involved in this episode, but this is from an old, old 20th century geek episode. So we're bringing this forward just for our listeners, because you may not have already heard it. Uh, as with the last episode, I do apologise, the audio on this is a bit rinky-dink, uh, and probably would need to clean up, but, you know, I'm not got the time and, and the skill to do that anyway this covers uh some more of the uh, imagination trilogy we spoke about time bandits before this covers brazil and the adventures of baron munchausen and then next week we're back on track next week next episode we're back on track and we're back with both julian and i in the studio and we talk about 12 monkeys so enjoy this episode and uh, i'll see you on the other side really for what for what the thematic trilogy really is because then we move on to brazil uh came four years later in 1985 uh written by terry gilliam uh tom stoppard and charles McEwen. and this is a world apart in in my opinion from um time bandits um i hadn't watched this in quite a while um and there were certain things that sort of that, that stuck in my head, certain scenes and certain elements. That when I watched Time Bandits again, I was like, "Oh, okay. I think this seems to be, you know, there's something triggering here. I think Brazil's going to be similar. It's going to be like, you know, uh, almost like a sketch after sketch after sketch." Um, but it's, it, it definitely feels like a more consistent film, um, mm-hmm. and I, I definitely like this a lot more. Um, I, I almost feel this is filtered through other films. Um, I can think, you know, from a, from a sort of almost from a um, stylistic, I can think of like Blade Runner, um, you know, the, the, those sorts of things. Probably, probably Blade Runner, that sort of neo future dystopia that's you know is, is uh, that Gilliam's trying to tap into with this film. What were your thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I, I had a very similar experience. I mean, I I watched them uh, or rewatched them in order, and it, it had been, uh, you know, probably, you know, uh, a, a decade to two since I'd seen any of them. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I found myself just a few minutes into Brazil saying, I like this better than the whole of time that is. <laughs> um, because if nothing else, it is as you say that it really struck me how influential, how this film wears its influences on its sleeve mm. in terms of, uh, you know, there is a lot of Blade Runner in there, but there's, there's also, you know, a lot of, you know, sort of like 60s dystopianism, uh, 70s dystopianism gets in there. And then thinking how influential this movie is. Mm. Um, You know, it's sort of like, I mean, if you haven't seen Blade Runner in a long time, going back and seeing it, um, I think the the fantasy sequences with the the wings and everything are are less influential. But, you know, I remember thinking, uh, you know, this could be a scene straight out of Burton's Batman. Mm. Um, You know, there, there was so much of of other movies that have influenced me or um, made an impression on cinema history that, you know, are so clearly influenced by Brazil. Um, and, I, and I thought just in terms of the sort of like, uh, I mean, it has a bit of the sort of like used future look that uh, Star Wars had that then goes through Blade Runner, you know, 
and other films, you know, Alien, um, you know, this sort of like industrial, uh, you know, very 1984. Yes. Uh, that's very much the way I imagine 1984. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, just the, the way it's shot. I mean, that, that uh, you know, that like, um, you know, room where everyone is goofing off uh, when the director isn't looking. It's just this narrow corridor with a sloping ceiling that, you know, has all of these, you know, bizarre computer magnified screen devices mm. in, and everybody's super busy in this space that is absolutely unsuited for human habitation, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, this, this way in which humans have to, to fit themselves to the architecture instead of the other way around. Um, you know, I just found uh, all of this just if nothing else intensely visually interesting i agree with that i think this is one of the it's a really beautiful film to see um and, and weirdly because it's, it's uh let's say 1984 is a clear inspiration for this film um yeah as you say um and although the sort of the story is um what's that? it's it, the, the story is relatively small in the grand scheme of things but the film also visually and stylistically feels incredibly claustrophobic. Um, as you say, sort of like the whole film is about being trapped in and the, the, you get that. So where I feel that like um, Time Bandits was tonally a little bit all over the place um, with humour and stuff. This this is a lot tighter uh, and, and is sort of there's a clear intent with almost everything you know, every, everything sort of feels like it's it's there for a purpose. Pretty much everything. There's there's, there's other bits like say of whimsy and, and imagination, but everything sort from the sort of the visual stylings of the offices to the apartments to the restaurants and everything else is is you know a level of claustrophobia. Um, even down to his car, the little one person car and everything mm-hmm. uh, that it just feels throughout it telling this story of this person trapped. And you know, then yeah. when you so when you do get his imagination of him flying free over this sort of vista of greenery and sort of forestry, you know, it's ch- and chasing that one, um, the um, you know the perfect woman as he sees it. it. You you feel that difference of like you know he is only free and able to explore his world in his imagination, and then he gets pulled back to to um, this ho- horrible blocky vent uh you know filled world um and I, I, yeah i just think it's fantastic i really enjoyed this film yeah me too and i i love the duct work uh yeah. you know i love that you know which is sort of like classic postmodern architecture but um you know of sort of like having structures visible um but you know i have the same sense of just feeling uh you know, trapped in this sort of dreamlike world, mm. but all of the physics of that world work. I mean, it's clearly the real world. I mean, as as much as it might be a hallucinatory sort of a, a parallel timeline or something. Um, and you know, another thing that works. I mean, I think you're right about the role of imagination. That that whereas you know, what is the role of imagination in Time Bandits, right? I mean, it's just, I'm a kid in the audience. This is imaginative and awesome. Mm. Um, I don't know, besides that, what it has to say. I mean, the pain of Brazil is that the role of imagination right through the end is escape. Yes. And is escape from what, what Gilliam clearly feels of, you know, the authoritarian structures, bureaucratic structures. Um, my nightmares, I, I never have nightmares about public speaking. Uh, mm. you know, I'm a teacher. I never saw a microphone that I didn't, you know, think <laughs> I should be up there. Yeah. Uh, I'm a narcissist, but, um, I have nightmares about bureaucracy. Mm. I have nightmares to this day that I am registered for a college course that I just have forgotten to attend and I'm going to fail it. You know, that, that there's a slip of paper somewhere that has my name and a class on it, and because of that, you know, I, I'm going to be kicked out of graduate school. Um, 
you know, I, I share this sort of nightmare of, of bureaucracy and, you know, the, the role of imagination as sort of this place, which you said very well, of this place in which um, the character is free to, to fly and, um, you know, he's able to surmount these obstacles. He's sort of a heroic uh, sort of superhero type in a way. Um Makes it makes it sad and and kind of, but but bittersweet in a kind of beautiful way. Yeah, and I, I think you know one of the reasons I, I can relate to that that thing of you know when when you are sat in I, I being a teacher yourself I I work in a more corporate world, and so that level of bureaucracy, uh, especially where things like unions are involved exists you know okay you've got to fill this form and you've got to involve these people you've got to let them know you've got to make sure you know da, da, da. and there's that that structure and that, i do as a project manager have those nightmares where i wake up at like you know i've had it where i've woken up at four o'clock in the morning thinking oh my god i've got to email that person i've got to make that phone call i've got to let that person know to make this one thing happen and if it doesn't happen then this other thing can't happen and and you know so and then then you do sort of stop yourself and you sort of take a step back and you go, okay, that's a crisis, or it could be, it could be a big thing within this project, or within this part of the company. But do you know what? In the grand scheme of the world, <laughs> yeah, does it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, and you've got to sort of no, take I, that I, breath. And I think that's so. I've had that. I've had that. Sorry, I've sat at that. I've sat at those desks where you have that daydream. And you do think like. Wouldn't it be cool if I could just fly out? If I was Superman in the universe and I could fly, or I could be, if I was, you know, just that character and I could just go off and do whatever I wanted to do. It's, I've had those daydreams where I thought like, this is killing me. So what, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be, um, scenarios? Yeah, I really identify with what you're saying, man. I mean, I, I, I you know, I. Uh... You know, I go to therapy, and and one of the things that comes out in therapy is often exactly these points that that I have so much stress, mm. and it's over all of these totally bureaucratic, artificial things, right? And and a lot of what I get out of therapy is just pulling out of that and saying, wait a minute, none of these things have intrinsic value, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we have created a world in which we wake up at four o'clock worried that somebody hasn't been consulted or a form hasn't been filed, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there is no natural state of us as a, as a species, uh, as animals who, who love our children and have dreams and, and fantasies and, and any of it in which, you know, any of these things matter, right? Mm. I mean, this is all utterly absurd. And I, and I think that the absurdity of Gilliam is uniquely suited to, to pointing this out. No, I agree. I think that's the point. Like they say you do, you look into this film, especially um, there are conversations between um, uh, the main character, sort of uh, Jonathan uh, Price's character, and then Ian Holm, who's his boss, uh, and they talk about exactly that thing filling out a, a d12 form or a you know a 34p yeah. form and it, they, they, feel, they, they, they oh my god they, we've got to fill that in make sure it's filled right or they'll be blaming us and I, I i i can just although it's it's done as sort of a joke in the film i'm like no no, no I, I completely hear you <laughs> i completely <laughs> sympathize with that it, it's it's sad that that's the situation but that's exactly what it is uh, yeah think, and and you can certainly see a, a, a man of Gilliam's disposition uh, chafing under that kind of environment. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think that's why you know I think it is it is shown so well in this film that you know when he does have his imagination, um, his daydreams, and the more stress he comes under, the fact that that sort of that stress and pressure starts to materialise in that imagination and that imaginary world. Um, you know, yeah. um, two two things happen though that I really like that I think are really I really sort of uh, empathise or sort of uh, connect with in this film is that moment of even in my imagination those barriers or those big walls start firing up at the ground and you're like yep yeah, you know I, I can imagine that's the case you know I'm under pressure 
I can no longer retreat into that imagination because I keep coming back to this same problem. But then it's that thing he keeps seeing himself as the hero in that situation. Um, I'm probably going to be giving up a bit myself for this, but that, that hero complex of like, okay, well, I'm the one who's going to have to stand up for this and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make sure this situation works out right. And, you know, he, even with his, uh, his, his sort of like angelic winged armour that he is going to stand up to whatever this evil is. In this form, it's, it's the form of a, like a large samurai warrior um, and he's going to combat it. And I'm like, I can... I so sort of connect with that character of like, no, I, I am going to be the brave one. I am going to be the hero. I've got to do this. Um, it, it completely resonates with me. Um, and I really feel for him. Yeah, I mean, I I don't, I, I don't know. I, I find myself thinking, like, I, I, I want us to list, like, what we like and what we don't like. Mm. Because so much of it is, idiosyncratic i mean so much of it is hard for me to put a finger on you know one of the things that i don't like is i identify with you know wanting to be a hero and sort of you know but but i i tend to put responsibility on myself Mm. for fixing situations and i would totally you know uh you know, put more responsibility on myself for sort of, you know, changing this whole society in a way that doesn't interest him. Um, uh, I like that aspect, but that that main character, uh, I, I found myself really loathing him uh, mm. over the course of the film. That, you know, I found myself thinking, like, this man has left. I identify with him, but I also loathe him. This man has left a wake of destruction in his wake. Uh, you know, yeah. he has sort of sabotaged his his coworker. He's gotten this promotion. Uh, you know, he's done absolutely nothing at his new job. He's blown up the docks just because he was frustrated or, or losing his mind. Um, you know, he's fighting with his, his coworker, and then and the next stop is over. He's forced that coworker to compromise himself and not been concerned about, uh, you know, the implications. Um, you know, he ends up running through a barrier and just, you know, um, I, I find myself thinking, you know, I mean, he's told, um, you know, by that, that wonderful, the, the wonderful, uh, torturer sort of doctor character, mm-hmm. um, you know, he, you know, here's the file, be sure not to lose it. Within five minutes, you know, it's yes. all over the street, right? You yeah. know, and this is a horrible person. Um, you know, he is opposed to a fascist totalitarian state that it, it's not really clear to me whether there really are any terrorists or, um, you know, clearly that is a, a, a terrible state. But at the same time, he's not really interested in fighting it, and he just seems to sabotage and destroy things. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think it's it's, it's funny we you, know, you talk about other films, uh, you know, these dystopian films, <clears throat> and the hero is often sort of it's them against the state of you know trying to bring down, uh, disrupt the status quo to bring it to a more um, humanitarian sort of like position. Everything from let's say Vita Ven- V for Vendetta or you know these other types of films. But yeah, you're right. He's not he's not rebelling against the state. Um, in, in this film, like that's not his motivation in this. I mean, originally, the, or initially, the, the motivation is is literally to clear up a clerical error. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's only when he meets the potential girl of his dreams that it sort of it starts to spiral out of control. So you're right. Th- th- this whole film is driven by his self interest, um, rather than than uh, a desire to do good for the for the you know for the greater good of humanity like that. Yeah, it is. Everything happens in this film because he is looking out for himself and trying to give himself a better future. Um, which, to be fair, at the, f- the start of the film, he doesn't even particularly want, does he? Because he sort of like he, re- right. he, re- he rejects the. He, he says, "Okay, I, I've rejected the promotion. I'm never gonna. I don't want to go anywhere because this is the easy life. Um, I've got no real ambition." It's only okay. so I say when when this mistake happens and he meets um, the the girl. That he starts to sort of try and
single minded, um, as you say. But well, and I, I love this. I mean, I love that he's not. This isn't the usual sort of, you know, uh, blow up the totalitarian state, right? Mm. I mean, he's not a revolutionary. I, I love that. I mean, it, it strikes me as uh, parallel to some of uh, Philip K. Dick's protagonists, who are all petty, petty people, right? Mm. Um, and, and, and I love that aspect of it. I, I think what I don't like is how nervous the, the main character is, that, you know, how anxious he is. I mean, he seems so uniquely unsuited. As you say, he has no ambition. He seems so uniquely unsuited to this society. And I found myself thinking of Camus' The Stranger, mm. where... You know, again, it's sort of about an outsider, but that's not an outsider who uh, wants to blow up the system. It's just somebody who doesn't fit in by disposition. Um, and I don't, I, there are scenes in which uh, the protagonist is so uh, nervous or anxious that I find myself um, having trouble identifying with him. Um, you know, when he's commanding, uh, He's run away from the, the list has taken him into the basement, and he's run away back to the lobby to, to you know, of the Ministry of Information to uh, meet the girl of his dreams. And armed men intercept him, and then they see his badge, and he sort of, in a very namby pamby way, says, "Oh yes, very good, carry on." You know, but he's so nervous; he doesn't, even when he's given authority, he doesn't know what to do with it. He doesn't. Uh, you know, even he's not even able to play the role of an authoritarian. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost like he forgets he's got the he forgets he's got the authority. Like he feels like he's, you know, he forgets he's in that position of power over some of the people that are, 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 are chasing him down. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I do agree that, like you say, throughout the film, it's sort of it's always. Um, yeah, he he's not used to this position, but he's always shown as being slightly weak, and uh, you know, I say anxious. And I, actually, I think in the film, like you said, there's the moment in the it, I think it's the docks. And he, you know, he, he's in the, the lorry with the, with the um, with the girl, and he drives through. It all gets blown up, and you know, um, he he's like say he's trying to he's taking the wheel. He's got to do that, and then he actually he has almost like that hero moment. He's like, oh, I did that. I achieved that. And then she makes him look back through the window and sees like there's people on fire, the things have all been destroyed. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's that realization again for him, like you know, yeah, you've you think this is a hero moment, but actually look at what you've just done. Um, but if you were to be watching a film where it was the the, uh, the protagonist against against the state, that right. would that would be um, the hero moment. You know, right? No, exactly right. And, that... and, and there are consequences. I mean, we've talked about, uh, you know, Man of Steel. I mean, V for Vendetta is, uh, especially in the comic, is very clear. People are going to die. Yeah. Uh, this is not a purely good thing. Uh, and I, I do love the way in which that kind of undercut there. The hero moment is, uh, you know, the rug is pulled out from under you. Mm. And I think that's what does achieve this. I think you're right. Whilst I do... Um, you know, I, I do sort of connect with his character at times with some of the frustrations. That I I do like that they constantly do keep pulling the rug out from under him. Like you know, they he keeps thinking he's onto something or he, he's got that position um, or a lead. It's like I I think of the like, other like noir mystery films where you know you've got like the the gumshoe or the tough detective that's going to track these things down, and you know they get into a situation and they'll get it out with a sort of a two their two fists and their wits. And he's the complete right. opposite of that, that he'll, he'll stumble into something or um, somebody has to come and help him out. But he keeps getting bits of information, but it's it's always sort of like him st- literally stumbling from one position to another through through other people's uh, energies and very little that he does on his own. Um, you know, like even the Robert De Niro... Um, <laughs> rebel... Uh, rebel... Plumber, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, air conditioning <laughs> technician, uh, you know, helps him out and does all this stuff, and again takes him to that next position and that next position, and he, you know, his his mum gets him that job in the Ministry of Information, and then, um, 
he you know in doing that he has to get some of the information from somebody else it's, it's always coming from somebody else never him really being hugely um proactive really in a, in a great deal of things and right. um, yes yeah, so it's it, it interesting to see he's never that hero which is a brave move and it's, it's truly gilliam to say that like yeah he's not he's the protagonist but he's never actually a hero um, well, I mean, I found myself, another movie I found myself thinking about is uh, Alphaville, uh, mm. a sort of uh, rare French New Wave dystopian film, which I, which I quite like, um, and which also, you know, the sort of dystopian society is just the kind of fait accompli. This is just the way it is. There's not really, you know, a, a, a revolutionary out to destroy this, but one difference that I, I hadn't realized and it only came out in, in listening to you was that um, the depiction of usually when we get these sort of fascistic dystopias there's a guy in charge, right? Mm. I mean and, and that's partly because you have a revolutionary plot, you need to have a guy to overthrow mm. um, so, you know, it's the, the voice of fate in, in uh, V for Vendetta um, but um, you know, usually beyond that, there's more of a sense of order. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I love about this dystopia in Brazil is that you don't get a sense that any of this is really for anything. Um, I love that, you know, the inciting incident is sort of confusing two people's names mm-hmm. um, and, and how unbelievably dark it really is. Um, you know, that you find out later that, uh, you know, the wrong man has been tortured to death. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that, that torturer is so wonderful and, and how unconcerned he is with this. I, well, um, I actually love that moment because it's Michael Palin who uh, play in the torture. And it's, there, are, there, are, there are two moments in, with him um, that I, I, well, there's a couple of moments I love. When you first meet him, um, uh, Jonathan Pierce meets him. In, in, you know, he's got, Jonathan Pierce is in his grey suit and he's off to do his um, archiving job, and it's it's very mundane. And he meets Jack, who is is Michael Palin's character, and he's got a sort of like a nicer cut, trend, you know, uh, raincoat, and he's got he's looking a bit more da- sort of flashy and a bit pedazz. And he's off to work in the Ministry of Information. He says, "Oh, so, you know, so how how are things? How's the kids? Oh, it's all fantastic. Yes." You know, we should catch up. We should do this. We should do that. And he, he's sort of seen as a bit of a go-getter. And uh, um, you know, you think, oh, he's 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 working his way up the ladder. And even his even Jonathan Pierce's mother says to him, you know, look at what Jack's doing. He's you know, he's he's going up. He's he's got a promotion. He's doing this, doing that. And it's almost laid at him like, you know, you should be more like Jack. And then when you find out that Jack is actually a torturer for the Ministry of Information, you go, you sort of go, oh, so so that's what you do. That's your job. Um, and it's almost become sort of, and then you find out later on that it's become so pedestrian to him, so mundane, such a sort of everyday job that he literally brings his daughter to his office, mm-hmm. where one room over he has been torturing people to death. Um, and when they when they sort of press him on the death of uh, Tuttle or Buttle, um, he he says, "Well, it's not my fault. You know, I thought I was torturing Tuttle, and no one mentioned to me that Buttle had a heart condition. And if Buttle's heart condition wasn't in Tuttle's Tuttle's file, well, that's not my problem. That's somebody else's problem. That's their department. There's no. Yeah. I, I love the fact that there's no remorse and no sort of like you know consequence. It's just like oh, it was a, it was just a, it was an administrative error. Uh, that's not my department. Yeah. I just do my job. Um, it gets incredibly dark. And it's it is yeah. it's it's shocking, really. Well, I mean, yes, but uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, you know, sort of like, well, yeah, we we droned the wrong people, but you know, uh, mistakes happen in war, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it is incredibly dark. Um, I, I love uh, when you first see him; he's he's in a sort of white lab coat, mm. covered in blood, yeah. and and he's like. Oh, good to see you! you know, yeah. like, the mood is utterly incongruous, and and you know takes it off and and, and plays with his daughter, and, and the, the level of just live unconcern is so mm. wonderful. Um, but then that that sequence starts, and, and um, they touch back on it later with a a, a woman who is transcribing a torture. 
character. <laughs> yes. And it, you know, it's so, I mean, that is, I mean, obviously it's a joke, right? But yes. That is so dark. I mean, the idea that there's somebody listening to the transcript, uh, to the recording of the torture and transcribing in bureaucratic fashion, no, please stop, stop, yeah. stop, stop, you know? <laughs> It's such a dark, uh, comedic little joke, but it really worked for me. Um, but, you know, and again, it's that level of just sort of what we have gotten accustomed to, that you can, it's that sort of banality of evil that Hannah Arendt talked about. Mm. I, I, I totally agree that that's it, that, you know, it's, um, you know, we, we can make anything every day. It's sort of everything. I suppose becomes, like you say, the you know modernity of, of evil is. After a while, it just becomes. Uh, we, funny enough, just just before you start recording, we talked about um, surveillance Britain. You know the the joke that every every inch of Britain is is covered in is covered in cameras, and you just you, for a while there was a whole uproar about it, and everyone just went, oh well, and moved on. And it's 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 now the thing, and it it does have its bo- its benefits definitely, but. For for a t- for a time, it was there was really people pushing back against it, and now it's just the norm, it's just the standard. And then, so what's next? What is the next thing that everyone will go? Oh, okay, well that's just the norm, I suppose, and we move on. Um, and again, I suppose that's another element of the corporate that that sort of uh, artificial corporate nature of things that we just build things up and make things important, just so that we've got something to do. Um, and sometimes yeah. it's just you know it, it can be it's a dark horrible job but well someone's got to someone's got to do it sort of thing right and 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 that way in which in a bureaucracy it's like well yeah I mean and, and this goes back to, to Eichmann and to Arendt that you know yeah um, hey I didn't set the rules yeah. um, you know I I didn't uh, start a campaign of torture I mean I'm a functionary mm-hmm. um, you know, and we're all functionaries. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of things that, uh, you know, our, our governments do that we might not agree with, but, uh, you know, we give our tacit consent, uh, you know, as we pay our taxes and, and, and do what's expected of us. Um, and, you know, this gets back to what I was saying earlier about, like, what's interesting to me and what I hadn't realized until this conversation is, is the extent to which this dystopia has has no function, right? Mm. Um, you don't get the sense that there's somebody at the top, or if there is, you never meet that person. Um, you know, why, obviously it's a sort of consumerist society, um, but why with the plastic surgery and everything else, which is, which is very interesting, but why uh, all of these rules are the case? I mean, everybody is practicing cover your own ass, right? You know, it's yeah. not my department. Uh, you know, uh, nobody is more concerned than when, uh, you know, a check arrives for somebody who's deceased. And, you know, oh boy, now we're in trouble. How do we deliver this? She doesn't have a bank account. You know, the, uh, the inheritor, um, <laughs> who is, of course, you know, the person who's been tortured by mistake. Uh, the greatest concern is that there'll be a bureaucratic error but again, there's no sense of like, well, why, like, you know, I guess there's terrorism and that justifies this sort of regime of terror, but, uh, and of torture, but, you know, you don't get a sense of why any of these rules are in place. No, again, and I think this comes down to, again, this, this sort of, the Gilliam-esque nature of this is... He see again, you know. I said before about um, any figure of authority. I think I think it comes to any governance, government structure of authority. I I honestly think he sees it almost as pointless. And I'm not saying he's an anarchist, but there is, um, you know, that thing of of you say sort of what is the point of this? I don't think there's supposed to be a point. I think this is something that you say that he's it's just grown into this thing, and everyone's just gone. Well, I've got a job, and I'm doing my thing, and I, I get paid, and I. You know, it, it, it's literally just become that thing. But to flip it over, you know, you do say that you know through, that th- throughout the film, there's this um, subplot or their you know story of, of the terrorist organisation that's, re- that's rebelling against um, the this authoritarian uh, regime, 
that you don't even get a great hint about that either to be perfectly honest you sort of you get bits and pieces of it but again it's it's not driven by that he doesn't become a member of the rebellion or anything like that well at least not not really um mm-hmm. but there's a great scene when he thinks that the girl that he is pursuing is a member of this terrorist organization um and she has a package and they're in a shop or they're in a sort of like a a, a shopping center or a shopping mall and a, a, and a bomb goes off and he instantly thinks it was her and right. um there's a but there's a great moment in that which again is incredibly dark from you know because it's been you've you've gone from a moment of um absurdity which is this is where i think that gilliam starts to really sort of balance things well of his his the friend of his mum's who's been having plastic surgery and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Like, you know, it starts off with she's got a slight patch on the side of her face, and then you see her again, and she's got her entire head bandaged, and she's got, then you see her next time, and she's in a wheelchair, and it keeps getting worse. And so there's this joke about, they said, that like, she said, oh, it's just a small um, skin irritation. It'll, it'll be gone in a jiffy. And, you know, so you've got this absurd nature. And then a bomb goes off, and strewn across the shop, are these bodies bloodied, broken? You don't see it. It's not graphic, but you get you get the point of the confusion and the sort of you know this this in an instant this has happened, um, and he blames her and says that you know this is what you've done to people. And you, 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 it it's quite again it undercuts that sort of um, you know the, this nature of this film. It constantly sort of it, it throws sort of. Um, grenades at you for one of a better phrase it's like all of a sudden like this happens and I've, i found that quite sort of not not as much shocking but it was it it throws you back into the film it jolts you awake again to go oh my god yeah this is actually you know there's, there is there is still something here that to have that happen uh for the bond to go off and actually have a to have such a you know not a, a to have not a silly consequence was actually quite surprising yeah well they are i think the sort of like tonal shifts that you identified in Time Bandits mm. are, are working for the movie mm. where, you know, the idea, you know, what's in, one thing that's interesting to me about it is that the characters don't seem to live in fear of these bombs. I mean, you witness multiple terrorist bombings over yeah. the course of this movie, but, you know, people are still shopping, they're buying their Christmas gifts, you know, um, and, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, they're not, uh, you know, living like, uh, you know, I- Israel in the old days of mm. sort of like, don't don't go out to dinner together because one of you will die. No, it's just like, oh, this is another thing we've got been accustomed to. There will be these bombings. And then uh, the way in which the protagonist does not move to help any of those people. He's mm. only concerned about, did the girl of his dreams blow them up? Mm. Um and so he's, he's scrambling for that package and confronting her, slipping on the blood in the bodies yeah. of just named people, <laughs> which he's unconcerned with. Again, I say it shows that like, the whole film is about his self-interest rather than that sort of... Again, the underlying, underpinning this issue that he's not the hero of this. No matter how much he... No matter how much he fantasises about himself in a heroic... Um, you know, fashion in a heroic sort of like position, it never comes to fruition. It never happens. Like he never actually does anything that's that's wholly heroic. He, you know, he never sacrifices himself. He never uh, puts others in before himself. It's it is, I say, it's all at his um, for his own self interest, really. Right, and the way in which he sees himself as a hero is just uh, that he will get the girl of his dreams, and when he meets her, he doesn't know who she is. Mm. Um, he doesn't trust her. He doesn't uh, put his faith in her. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, I mean, maybe we should talk about the ending of, of mm. sort of, uh, I, I, I think you're told that he, you know, there's this sort of fantasy, w- which is wonderful with the paper uh, falling, you know, 9-11 file from the Ministry of Information, um, you know, as, uh, you know, the, that renegade plumber who's doing unlicensed work in people's houses, yeah. uh, uh, you know, repels down as part of a revolution. Um, you know, and uh, it reminded me, I kept thinking of Clockwork Orange, um, 
you know, in, in all of this, this sort of uh, sense of torture and, mm. and you know, a, absurd sort of fantasy. Um, but I think you find out, and, and then all of this is, is sort of a dream, and, and he's just uh, catatonic. Um, and I, I love the way that the song, after which the, the title is uh, uh, comes from, um, you know, the sort of like whimsical fantasy, um, you know, comes in there and, and sort of ties together the whole movie. And I think you hear that uh, the girl's been killed, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, everyone's been <laughs> dead. And that's it, yeah, so uh, you're right. I mean, the ending is, like, eventually he gets captured by the Ministry of Intelligence and he gets taken in. And it's it's Jack, uh, you know, comes in. And I like the fact that um, in his... Uh, in his fantasy world, um, there's been these characters um, that have acted almost like these these dark beings that have been keeping him from from this this uh, fantasy lady, his you know the, this his ideal woman, and they're these sort of cloaked weird characters, but they've got baby doll faces, uh, and that all exists in the fantasy fantasy world, and they're, I mean, they're incredibly creepy, and I really like the effect they have. But then it's more, it sort of hits home a bit that when, when he's, he's strapped into the chair, he's been caught, he's strapped into the chair, he's going to be tortured with information, and the torturer comes in, and he's actually wearing one of those baby mask faces that they clearly wear to hide their identity or for whatever purpose. But it, it to me, it makes me question, like, to how aware of, was he of this practice? You know, if he, if he gave those... Um, dark figures, those faces. Does he know that these torturing things exist, and this is part of the uniform, or is it just a coincidence, or is it part of the you know the fantasy? Um, I, I really like that. But then I say when he's confronted by Jack, and Jack says, "Well, you've really screwed up on this one. You've really how am I? You know, you've really buggered me up." And again, it's Jack being a bit selfish, and he says, "Look, just tell me what what I want to know." And I think that's where it sort of you know, obviously it transitions then into the to the fantasy once the torture starts of him being rescued in the most heroic fashion um, and you get that sort of what he's always been hoping for is to be rescued and again the, the, the you know let's say the, the rogue Robert De Niro plumber comes in and he is now going to be the saviour of of the resistance and it's that sort of like you know it's it's what you expect there to be that that heroic moment of you're the only one we can rely on you, you're the you know you've got the information or whatever and then for you, again, the, the rug is pulled out from under you to be found that actually, no, 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 all that last segment <laughs> that you being rescued and meeting the girl and that sort of, all of that is is a complete fantasy. And that's him, you know, literally like being locked into that fantasy world. And it's just, all the stuff that I was you were thinking at the beginning of the film, you know, oh, you know, yeah, you need the daydreams and you've got that fantasy world where you can roam free is actually may not be as good as you think it is because actually you can get locked in it and you get distracted from the fact that you do have responsibilities no matter how manufactured they are to the real world it's a... yeah I mean you know when we were talking about Miracle Man um, mm. you know I, I said that one of the things that I like about it is the way in which all of these sort of like superhero tropes and kind of you know power fantasy, you know, being the hero, all of these things are subverted and made really sad. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, that uh, it, it still has all of those things, and those things are whimsical and wonderful, but at the same time, really sad, because, you know, they're part of, um, you know, a, a fantasy that is at odds with reality and is exposed to be... Uh, a kind of uh, escapism from a mm. from a work a day unsatisfying life, and I think that um, you know, for me, talking about the role of imagination, this idea that um, all of this imagination, all of this fantasy, all of the the whimsy of um, you know the the man with the golden wings that you know is so identified with this film um, exists to sort of escape this horrible bureaucratic nightmare reality yeah. uh, and ha has no other function than that. It's not uh, socially redeeming. It's just 
a kind of escapism. Um, and, and that strikes me as very sad. I mean, I think, you know, that last shot is so brilliant. I, I'm such a sucker for beginnings and endings. Mm. And that last shot, you know, sort of classic Gilliam wide-angle lens of the sort of like almost cerebro-like, uh, you know, or inside of an atomic reactor looking, you know, uh, thing of the, the main character catatonic at yeah. a distance in the in this huge landscape that dwarfs him, um, you know, in, in sort of fascistic uh, fashion. Um, as the music sort of swells, and then this time there are bongos and monkey sounds, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it seems as if, yes, I mean, we go to, uh, whether it's the opera or to movies to sort of like escape uh, some of this, uh, some of our reality. Um, and, Boy, that's driven home to me mm. by that ending. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, isn't it? It's, it's, you're you're totally right that that's exactly it. Is. It's it's sort of um, <laughs> you can escape for so long, but you've got to go back because um, you know say that you know it, 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 it's only an escape for a short amount of time, and you know, and if you do give into it, then you've you've you are completely disconnected. Um, you know, to that catacomb, like saying the catatonic world that he's in. So, to wrap up on sort of Brazil, then really, I mean, we've you know, I think we've taken a step forward then from Time Bandits, um, in that this is a, mu I think this is a much better film, a much sort of, I mean, it's a hundred and forty something minutes long, so it's not, it's not a short film, but it's, there's so much in there to talk about, and there's so much I think you can take from this. But do you also think that do you think this is a better film, or do you think this is also you watch this at a certain time of life and you get something more from it. No, I think this is a better film. Um, I, I think that, I mean, this is sort of, I, I think it's usually regarded as uh, Gilliam's classic. Um, mm. I, I don't know that I quite see it that way. Um, but, you know, in the sense that I think there are other Gilliam movies that I like and I might put up there of equal uh, value. But, um, yeah, there's no doubt that this is a classic film. And this is a, this is, you know, if you are interested in cinema, you can know cinema history without knowing Time Bandit, right? Yes. You can't really do that without having seen Brazil or Blade Runner or, or you know, Clockwork Orange. I mean, this is in there uh, among those films. I agree. No, I totally agree. This is, um, and it, it seems not only not only is it sort of I think a representation of of, of Gilliam at possibly you know at his height, it's not his peak, but in his a, play, doing his A game. I also think it's it's a a typical sort of eighties um, representation as well. It, it it kept coming through that. Yeah. Um, I know there are stories of dystopian futures that sort of, you know, come out all the time, but this just felt, I don't know, there was just something for, to me that felt intrinsically 80s about this. Uh, and for someone that was obviously living through Reagan era America and Thatcher era Britain that I don't think would have come out at other periods in history. So, uh, yeah, you're right. It, it represents a lot, really. I think it's a, gr I think it's a really good film. Uh, and I'm really glad and to go too. back to it. And, and there are so many uh, moments, I mean, we haven't even talked about, you know, those narrow offices, the, mm. you know, the idea of sharing a desk, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's so brilliant, the, the, the billboards all along the road, you know, sort of the, the ultimate absurdity of, you know, uh, advertisements everywhere, um, you know, there's so much in this film that while those are, you know, those are great notes, and, and I think you could ding a grace note here or there as, uh, you know, out of sync with the overall project of the film. There are so many uh, of these grace notes, of these little whimsical mm. elements that, you know, that just transcribing of the torture and things like this, that, you know, the child in the room, um, <laughs> that just uh, really resonate and are um, just classic, wonderful, beautiful, uh, albeit horrifying images. No, I agree. I think there's so many, like you say, you you know, and I'm sure someone has written about this in great detail, but there's so many little things to pick out. Let's like say the billboards that, that, that run along the road and you see them 
um, like you say, the, the continual advertising. But I like the fact that it's not just they're not just there to act as advertising. That when you pull back, you see the wider world either side of them, and it's just a wasteland, like polluted wasteland. Yeah. So it, it does to show that they're not they're actually there as a distraction, you know, to hide to hide the truth um, of what exists behind them. And I think that's another you know, if you're gonna get if he's gonna do any satire, I think that sort of starts to to dip its toe into that satirical world. Um, and he definitely get, he gets stronger at it from Brazil, I think. Boy, that's that's brilliant. Uh, you know, I hadn't even uh, thought of that implication. I mean, I remember the wasteland, but the idea that really all of this advertising, all of the plastic surgery, exists to hide this horrible reality yeah. uh, is it, quite resonant. And it, I th- that's why I think this film still stands up today is because it's. It, there is so much in there that is still resonant today that you could still, you can still pick that out and you can still look at the world around you and say, "Yep, yeah, that that has got a you know that's got a mirror image in this world in some fashion." Um, especially with the, the plastic surgery, you know, the sort of his mum looking younger and younger and sort of, um, you know, in this sort of cosmetically driven and sort of. Uh, incredibly sort of fashion conscious world that you know that's that's clearly the case isn't it so yeah quite it, it definitely rolls true so let's so let's move from one film that i think still resonates with the with the the real world around us to the final chapter of the imagination trilogy uh 1988's uh, the adventures of baron munchausen um written by terry gilliam and charles McEwen. And based on the novel from 1785, I've got uh, by Rudolf uh, Eric uh, Rasp or Rasp. Um, this is the sort of the one that focuses on sort of um, the older generation, sort of, and the, the the use of imagination and telling stories and uh, looking back on one's life. Um, the uh, Baron Munchausen of the title, sort of telling those sort of tall tales of things that have gone on in his past. Um, what were your thoughts on this film? Well, um, I, I, I'm curious to hear what you thought. I, I thought that this was sort of a cross between Brazil and Time Bandit. Mm. Um, it has some of the same uh, episodic uh, structure of Time Bandit, um, where... You know, as Munchausen is sort of putting the, the old gang of, of basically superheroes back together, mm. um, you know, you go through episode after episode. Um, I do think that there isn't the same sort of like wild tonal shift uh, of the original uh, or, or Time Bandit. Um, and I found that there was some resonance there from Brazil that. Uh, it was a better film than Time Bandits. I like the idea of Munchausen having uh, reached old age and passed into legend, uh, although he's still alive. Mm. Um, and and I love some of the sequences. I mean, some are clearly, you know, badly dated. I mean, I think the Robin Williams stuff on the moon, is, you know, the the shots on the moon are beautiful, but you know then you know there's way too much just Robin Williams being Robin Williams as a floating head, and you're like, yeah, get back to the climbing the arc of the moon and to deserts made of you know yeah. gray sand. Um, so I mean, there's great stuff, but there's also some stuff that doesn't work, um, and. Uh, and I object to the ending. I mean, I think the ending has all the problems of Time Bandits and, and worse. But I like the idea of the stage. I mean, I like the, uh, you know, I think the, the sequences work better. I, I like the basic idea of sort of looking back on your life. Uh, and, you know, so for me, it's sort of like a Time Bandits 2 um, with, uh, some of the depth of Brazil, some of uh, a little tighter storytelling or tonal control. Um, and and also for me, I mean, as a, as a literary guy, I like that um, there's a version of Baron Munchausen in the same way that I, you know, I, I like Don Quixote. I, mm. I like the idea that as we live in this sort of like superhero uh, world now, you know, which we didn't uh, at the time in cinema, that this was made, um, that we remember the sort of uh, picaresque, uh, you know, the sort of uh, episodic uh, tall tales from uh, earlier eras. 
Mm. Um, what's your take on it? No, I, I definitely, I totally agree with that. It's a mix of sort of say the 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 Brazil and, and Time Bandits in that sort of it's a much it's a tighter film than than uh, Time Bandits, although it contains those episodic um, like the stories, almost like an anthology kind of way at times. Um, but again, like I said, those themes come through, and the fact you've got like Jonathan Pierce coming back as a sort of a French um, bureaucrat this time, um, you know, and and, and they. There's a moment in this film I love the fact that sort of like just again like it's clear that Gilliam's got a problem with bureaucracy because at the moment the the end of the film I'll jump to that is when they're arranging to surrender and they're saying so you so you'll surrender next Wednesday and, it, and it's your turn uh, this time um, is is brilliant but I, I, there's a charm to this film that I really love and I think I've always enjoyed this film for that reason it's sort of th- this film is is um, Baron Munchausen is a con man. And there's a film, but the, the thing about this film is it's bullshit, and I love that. That this is clearly sort of like say, um, someone's tall tales. That you know he's he's stood by to sort of impress his impress people, or um, you know to, just just to, to big himself up. Um, and I I'm I'm willing to go with that because it's it's, just, it's such a fantasy nonsense um, <coughs> that they've. The, the problems do definitely come at the end, and so let's like say the pro- the tonal shifts that there were a problem in Time Bandits. He's addressed, I think, in this by by mm-hmm. admitting from the outset that yeah, this is just some old bloke telling stories. You know, like don't take any of this seriously. Like this is all to be taken with a pinch of salt. Like you know, okay, yeah. So he, he you know, he had he had this super uh, this this group of super friends that could do all the things. He got you know. One can run really fast. One can um, has got super hearing. One's super strong. One's got super sight. You've got all these things, and he can. They've gone all these adventures and this wonderful, crazy stuff. Um, so don't don't try and apply too much common sense to it, because even as a filmmaker, like they're admitting that it's 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 bullshit. Um, and I, I just I just kind of like that. That it's sort of it's quite. Um, you sort of I don't know. I, there's not sympathy. I'm thinking the wrong word, but there's there's a sort of a just a charm to it that I I, I kind of like of of you know um, that 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 tall tale that that idea that yes we travel to the moon and yes I was actually I, I'm that strong I'm able to lift myself out of the water by picking myself up by my hair and um, you know I I can make it I was trapped inside a whale and I made it sneeze with a bit of snuff and. <laughs> It's it's lunacy. It's it's ludicrous, but I, I it's the right level of ludicrous for me to to enjoy yeah, it. I think that's why yeah, I really and, enjoy and, it. That, and that stuff goes back to those original stories. Yes. Um, you know the the idea of playing with physics and having a laugh at you know pulling yourself up. Um, you know goes back to those original stories, and and I can buy it within that world of tall tales. Mm. And I kept thinking, uh, watching this again, uh, of uh, Big Fish, mm. which, you know, has some of the same sort of idea of a man at the end of his life. But there, I think, has maybe a little more emotional resonance because he's with his kid mm. who's struggling to deal with, you know, how do I understand these tall tales? Um, I think that the, the girl, while charming in Munchausen, I have a little bit of the same sort of reaction that I do with uh, Time Bandits, where I think, you know, where is that father who, you know, yeah. we've seen early on, you know, sort of, you can kind of understand why he runs away, but then she doesn't miss her dad, you know, the dad doesn't miss her. I don't even think he's seen again. Uh, it, no, I agree. I mean, she, she's a typical sort of like movie kid, like, you know, they sort of, They've got a level of bravery and things more so than the adults around them, which it either works or it doesn't. And I agree that in this, she becomes a little bit irritating at times and sort of almost a hindrance to the story. Um, but I, I also, like I say, I like the fact that the problem is that we had with, with Time Bandits was that it didn't stick to its own. There was no internal logic, but there almost is with this. Um, yeah, I agree. And there are elements as well that I re- the things that sort of spring out to me about this as well that I really like actually thinking back is this idea of um, 
not even legacy, but but, but sort of uh, adulation. Uh, for, you know, so at the, at the beginning of the film, like you know, he's fallen into almost um, a figure of fun. You know, so the, there's a play about him that's being laughed about and all this other stuff. And when he then, when he finally does break onto the stage and interrupt the play and tries to give his tale of it, and and the building starts to collapse, he wants to give in to death. You know, he's given to that point. And I love the figure of death in this. Again, it's it's a really creepy oh, yeah. depiction, the angel of death. Um, that he wants to give in. He's just like, look, just let me die. Or did I die? And he's like, no. He's like, bugger. It's it's great that, like, you know, but as he, he gets into the adventure and as he's able to tell these tales and, you know, these things happen, he, he's, you know, he gets younger. You know, he, his hair isn't grey, his moustache gets this luster back and he's more willing to do things. So when you get to the sort of the third act, he's, you know, 20, 30 years younger. Um, and I love this idea that to be in the mix again, to be relevant again, to be listened to and to have that, you know, have that ad- level of adulation makes him younger and gives him that verve back. And I think that sort of, it's really true that as you do get older and you know you might feel that you lose some of that relevance and people aren't listening to you again you sort of become isolated and and you know you probably feel older than you do and i'm projecting but i I just love that tone of it as well that there are moments in this film when he does feel lost and he gets old and and broken again like when he's in the whale but then again when he you know when he's able to break out and he gets back he's young again it's, it's it really sort of um that sort of speaks to me a bit really i suppose yeah, I like all of that. I, I also find myself thinking of, um, you know, sort of the idea of an older figure who, um, you know, uh, had dreams and, and had adventures too. Mm. And, you know, this sense of like, um, you know, I mean, I've got uh, elderly parents and I admit there are times where, you know, it's like, all right, I don't want to hear this story again. You know? yeah. I've heard this story 20 times. I never knew this person. I haven't thought of them in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, all right, man. You know, uh, I, I, I don't want to hear this. But, you know, those people, uh, whether they're our parents or just people as they get older, had uh, hopes and dreams and, and loves and adventures and I like what you're saying about the sense of validation that comes from just being able to tell those tales and have somebody interested. It, it clearly means, you know, before the sort of like magical, uh, yeah, this is all a story sort of cut there at the end. Um, you know, it means a lot to Munchausen that the girl cares and wants him to live, you know? Mm. Yeah, I agree. That's the thing. It's, 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 it, this, uh, let's say, that idea of adulation of someone looking up to you, um, is clearly important to him. But again, he's not. We, we've gone through this again. Sort of, we said it with Brazil and stuff that, um, you know, be the the motivation means self interest. In this, like Munchausen, he he is not. Although he is. Although he suggests he's doing this for the greater good to save the town. Like he he is he is a con man. Like he's again he's not a particularly nice person. Um, and again, it's sort of that undercutting of the hero trope of throughout the film he keeps lying to the little girl and saying like the town's fine. Believe me, they're all safe. Uh, we we've got to you know we're gonna do this, gonna do that. And it flashes back. It cuts back to the town under siege and like the you know they're all <laughs> under cannon fire or the doors getting battered down and all this is happening. And you, you do sort of, you know, although he may do these these things and have these tall tales or these these moments, like, it's it's all, again, in service of his own ego rather than any greater good. Um, and so, yeah, he's never actually a particularly good... He's never a hero, really, is he? Right. Um, no, not really. And, I mean, like, with he goes off with Venus, Mm. He's clearly not concerned about the mission anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and he's less, I mean, a, a, again, you know, it, it's hard because we have to kind of like specify what level of reality we're talking about in this film. Mm. But within his tale, 
I mean, he is, you know, he is uh, narcissistic. He's left his comrades in some horrible situations, not even looked in on them in 20 years. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because again, like you say, you know, like you said, it's, it's it's got that Blues Brothers moment of getting the band back together. And when he does find them, like you know, one of them's been trapped on the moon for twenty years. One of them's been in the service of um, uh, Volker, the the god. Um, two have been trapped in a whale. It's like you say, he he has he is clearly sort of moved on, and um, it, even like, at one point, Eric Idle as um, Eric Idle's character confronts him on this and says, so you're going to leave me here for 20 years, you turn up, you say you say you save me, and now you expect me to sort of follow you into danger again. And he, his response is mm-hmm. just like, well, well, yes, of course. <laughs> and, you know, and, yeah, Eric, quite, yeah, and Eric Holmes is like, like, oh, like oh okay. Yeah, and I quite like, uh, you know, the sort of twist of uh, him surrendering uh, and to the Turk and, mm. you know, sort of using that to inspire the others to, uh, you know, I mean, there is a sense of, you know, that sort of fairy tale logic of just, uh, uh, well, this is an interesting thing to do. Um, you know, or, or the, uh, you know, the, the Moon King's uh, mechanical flying beast that mm. uh, tears itself apart, you know. Um, and, and those elements work for me in this, whereas they did in a time band. That in Time Bandits, because it seems so... I mean, I guess here it's a tall tale, so you know, you know, I mean, you're in such a fantastical world that the idea that this is just whimsical and clever is interesting enough. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the thing, is that in this film, it's like you say, it's, it, it, again, it comes down to that internal logic, and because I, it's the coincidences... You know, in 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 Time Bandits, they sort of you know they've got the uh, the the get out of the map that gives them the doors into different um, parts of history, and so you have to give them that. And in this, it's just it's just a whole coincidence that you know um, he flies to the moon and after f- f- he literally falls from the moon to Earth and lands in a volcano where his next um, you know uh, next member of his team is being. Is, is there as a manservant, and then when he gets eaten by a fish, it's the fish that just happens to have like those coincidences again because you know, or at least you get that this is a tall tale. Those sort of those coincidences are, are going to happen because um, I I would expect this to be told. Although the film has got you know is relatively tight and the scenes are all well laid out and stuff. If if you were to be sat watching uh, Baron Munchausen telling this story. You can picture that it would be told in a rather rambling, probably quite a disjointed way, where you'd have to be almost taking notes to keep up with the tale as it rolls out. Because it'd be like, and then this happened. Oh, and whilst I was there, then there was this, and then the Sultan did this, and and I can imagine it being like that. That this, you know, you, I, I'm willing to give it that. Yeah, this is just some old bloke like recanting, recounting his tale. That's, you know, probably not got the same faculties he had 20 30 years ago so it's it's going to be it's going to be that little bit disjointed and i actually quite enjoy that element of it yeah i i like that too although i you know i'm realizing like with the ending being what it is that that you know it's strange that if, if this is all a story that he's telling from that stage mm. right the cut from reality into, you know, into fiction occurs before that stage is bombed. Mm. Because when you cut back to, you know, the end of the story, you know, the, the theater is intact. Yeah. Um, why would you tell a tall tale about what I'm going to do in the present situation? Well, it then ends with your death. Yeah. And, and then... How did the Turks disappear? Is that through the power of imagination? I, you know, it's again. It, that, yeah, that, I agree with the ending because I, I like the end of his speech when he tells the tale. It actually says, and that's one of the many times that I died um, saving a town. Yeah. And it's it sort yeah. of, but it, it goes almost to something that we, again we've talked. For, that goes to something that we've talked about in the past of that superhero cycle of sort of you know we've talked about the fact that like superheroes like yeah you know, Superman's been 
died, been dead and come back. Batman's been dead and come back. Like, you know, Captain America, they've all been dead and come back. Where, you know, you can imagine, I can almost imagine this being, you know, that superhero going, yeah, well, there was that time and, and uh, we defeated Darkseid, but I, I died and uh, I was then resurrected and, and then we went off and we fought him again. And it is, it almost feels like, you know, it's even before that became a, a bit of a cliche and a trope, that it's ta- it's making fun of a, co- a, a comic book, like almost like a superhero trope that I, that probably wasn't even acknowledged at that point. Oh, right. I agree. Uh, I agree completely. And I, and I love the death stuff. Um, you know, I just, and I, and I love the, that line. Mm. I just don't know what we're supposed to believe happened. Um, you know, how, why would you tell a story about, you know, what you're going to do about getting the gang back together to fight, yeah. you know, like, like, like you were pointing out and I quite love the cut to, especially when the music persists, uh, you know, the zany music in the scene and he says, Oh, don't worry. The town's fine. And you cut back to people being blown up. Yeah. Um, that works really well. But, uh, but uh, apparently that's not happening. Um, you know, uh, why would you tell a story about what you're going to do? This, um, this is the, but this is the Gilliam problem. I find this is the problem with Gilliam that again, um, he doesn't know how. He, he either he's, he's either never entirely happy with it with a conclusive ending. Like if that film had ended with. Um, the the, the 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 complete third act so you you know you'd have to lose him but if it ended with his death then mm-hmm. or even you know um a, a narration that actually had that line and that was just one of the times i died saving a small town i'd be quite happy with that you know because you would still have that hook of like well, what does he mean one the one of the times i died saving a small town you you still have that, but you could accept that you know yes that whole fantasy happened and he did take on the Turks. Or, you know, you could have the third act and it just be him beating the Turk and then riding off into the sunset afterwards. I don't. But like you say, the, the, Gilliam's so determined <coughs> to keep that imagination thing alive that um, it, it it becomes confused. Because, <coughs> sorry, even after that, so they open the gates. So they, they, you know, it's it cuts back to him back on the stage. They have a whole thing about opening the gates to prove the Turks have been beaten, and the Turks have been beaten. And then they have a short moment of him sort of, you know, being as if everyone accepts that he's done it, <laughs> roundly yeah. sort of applauded. And then when he rides off, and he just he literally just disappears. And he rides over a hill, and then it leads me to believe, like, so, so okay, so was he real? Is it, you know, is is this a tale? Is it? It's it's yeah, it's Gilliam's so determined to have um, absurdity and imagination inserted that I sometimes think that he starts to stumble over his own narrative. And I think this is another sign of that. That this could this could lose some of that ending and would be a much much stronger film. Yeah. Well, and you you also have the sort of like Wizard of Oz moment as like uh, Uma Thurman, you know, uh, as Venus uh, is, is sort of there in the mm. audience as he's dying, you know. Um, but you know, I think you're right uh, about the stumble. I mean, I cannot make heads or tails of the ending, mm. and. You know, and I think if this was all a, if this was all a fantasy, why are the Tur- why is the Turkish horde gone? Yeah. Um, if this was if this is all real, why is there the theater not destroyed? Um, you know, it, it seems very very odd to me, and it seems that you know I like the idea of this is only one of the many times that I died. And, and that this is sort of like all actually itself a story within a story, but it seems to me you could we could resolve that by oops, 
the role of imagination in Brazil touches me in a way that this doesn't, uh, I found myself kind of thinking at the end, like, okay, so was it the power of imagination that made an army disappear? Yeah. Um, was it the power of your story that made an army disappear? And that kind of dovetails with the depiction of, uh, of the general, um, you know, the sort of French general, uh, you know, who has a hero executed because it makes the other troops feel bad. Um, I, and, I, and I think, like, okay, this is a little overdone mm. uh, in, in the sense of, like, the forces of reason are, you know, this is like the age of reason, right? The forces of reason are just bad. Reason is just bad. Yeah. Uh, And again, that's the whole thing, you know, going back to this idea that, you know, I don't, I don't think they call it the age. Obviously, this is an, an, a Napoleonic um, army, you know, in some sort of uh, they're supposed to be French in some outpost, I believe, you know, in, in sort of the, the, the Middle East. It again, it feels like that push that that nudge, you know, he wants to have that period piece because because obviously, um Munchausen is uh, from the late eight, you know, late seventeen hundreds. So again, he sort of what, what corporate entity can I, or what authoritarian entity can I push fun at? You know, all right, it's going to be that Napoleonic um, structure again. You know, I, I could very right. much imagine. I could very much imagine that that you know Jonathan Pierce's uh, bureaucrat reports into Ian Holmes um, Napoleon. Yeah, sure. You know that 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 in this absurdist world, um, and I do like some of the logic about some. Of the, the, there are moments of, of of real greatness in this film that does I do like that when the heroic soldier at the beginning um, is presented and he sort of played by Sting, which is interesting. Um, he he took like you know six cannons and he's killed all these enemy, and the guy's like, well, don't don't do that. That sort of gets the people riled up. All these people that want to live a quiet life, you know, these bloody these bloody heroes keep making things difficult for us. Um, and again, it's that I love that as a as a, as a satire that sort of like no 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 it's status quo. You know, you didn't feel like you didn't feel like your B thirty seven form to go and do that sort of thing. Um, is an you know it, it's there's little moments like that in this that I really really enjoy. Um, again, and sort of. And then it's it's sort of all sort of, how was it undone? But it sort of it sours at the end when you do get this ending that you left sort of going what? I don't yeah I don't get what it means. So I I always think that Gilliam was his own worst enemy in that respect. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, I I thought that that bit early on, you know, with the hero, um, and I, I didn't recognize that it was Sting, but I thought Sting in the end credit. Uh, and thought, who in the world is he? Um, so thank you for that. But, you know, I, uh, I thought it was clever enough, but, you know, it seems to me that if you're going to satirize uh, sort of uh, uh, authorities and, you know, authoritarianism or bureaucracy, um, you know, uh, the way in which this tends to work is, you know, the heroic soldier gets, you know, sort of... Um, Inglorious Bastard style mm. used in order to manipulate everybody else who's suffering, you know, in in the trenches, so to speak. Um, you know, and they become this kind of propaganda piece, you know, sort of Russian style to inspire, you know, the average soldier to be Sakhanov. And, um, and the reality is the average soldier goes to war for patriotic reasons or whatever, and then winds up dying or getting very little out of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that is a more apt, the truth is a more apt satire than, uh, you know, I mean, I get what's being done. I, I think that, you know, what Gilliam's doing there is sort of like anyone who's different you know, the imagine even in war, if you use your imagination and you're different, you stand out and, you know, the, the, the what is it, the nail that sticks out gets the hammer. Yes. Um, right. So, you know, I think that's what's being done there. Uh, you know,
you know, and I think you're right that it's, you know, it's obviously mocking, you know, and you, you see that later on with the sort of like, you know, your turn to surrender kind of business. Mm. But, I mean, it seems to me that this isn't especially keen satire of why authorities or, you know, war is stupid and, you know, these authorities are stupid. It's not that they're this dumb, right? Uh, you see what I mean? No, I agree. I think that's the problem. I mean, you know, as you say, the, 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 the moments I take from that as well are that, you know, I don't think it's a mistake that they chose Sting. I think, you know, it's, he's, he's a good-looking guy. They've got him there. And he's, the, you know, he's even referred to as heroic soldier in the credits. And I think that, you know, you, you have this idea that in another film, in another version, he would have been the protagonist. Like, he's the one that would have saved the town. But in this one, because of his actions, actually, he's going to be executed because he's a, a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, and so the, I love that idea, by the way. That's brilliant. Yeah, and that's, that's what I mean. You, I like these little moments that you can take from that. But you're right that it's not as... Um, it's not as keen-edged satire or it's not as sort of pointed as other films have been or even as Brazil is in some cases that it feels a little bit scattershot and as I said with Time Bandits I get the feeling with some of this that some of it is plotted out and put in the script and then other bits are they've come up with this idea on the set and they're like oh we're going to do this let's let's do this that's a good thing to do Um and so it never quite, it, yeah, it never feels as sort of, um, yeah, it, ne- it never feels as sort of as impactful as it should be. Like you, you do watch these things and go, much more could have been done with this, or, you know, they could have just t- tightened it that little bit. Um, if, if anything, I feel a bit, like it's, you, we meant, you mentioned Robocop before and the satire in that. I feel it's the same, it's a similar thing in that that in the first one like Verhoeven really nailed it and you get that satire and it's sort of you know it's it's a clear vision of satire with the with the excessive violence and the, the the media and the corporate attitude like it's all there and it's lined up and people are being shot down bit you know boom 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 but as the tr- as the sort of the franchise goes on it just becomes oh it's a RoboCop film so we've got to have the adverts in you know or we've got to have the news points in. And so, all right, well, there's supposed to be a satire, so we'll do this. And it, but then, you know, and they're never quite as keen and as pointed as they should be. And that's what this feels like. It's like, well, you know, yeah, I can, I can make this point because I think it's a bit funny and it's going to poke fun at something, but it's never quite, you know what I mean? It's sort of... Right. Uh, um, and I just think that's a real shame. That it, again, like, tighten that up, and this, this, again, could have been a great a masterpiece. No, I, I agree with you, and I, and I think that it has more masterful scenes. I mean, I, I love the landing on the moon. I mean, mm. I, I love the, uh, you know, I, I mean, Uma Thurman is great, mm. uh, and uh, I didn't, you know, it's a very young Uma Thurman. This is, um, I think this is her first speaking role on screen. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's a, it's a fantastic role. Uh and I, I didn't even recognize her at first. And I mm. thought, my God, that's Uma Thurman. Uh, so bizarre. Um, but, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely worth seeing. Um, I did find, uh, as just as a, a sort of late thought on this, I did find that uh, I thought, am I just speaking out of my bias that of the sort of trilogy of, you know, Age of Imagination, that the one that speaks to me the most is, the one of like a a thirty something mm. guy, you know. Um, whereas when I was a kid, I mean, I had no problem. I mean, I watched Brazil, but I had no problem with Time Bandit. None of that stuff irritated me. Um, are there things? I mean, obviously Gilliam wasn't the age of Munchausen. I mean, he was sort of projecting. Um, but are there things in Munchausen that we might appreciate? as we were older or are we being mean through that childlike perspective of time bandits? Is this just, you know, me at this stage in my life <sighs> as I've kind of talked about like reality and, you know, imagination and how I, that changed for me identifying more with the, the one closer to my head. It, it, it's very possible. Cause I feel, I do feel the same. There was, it did, it did cross my mind that, um, you know, you, you, you and I say we we are 
you know, able to um, connect really with Brazil because we live in that world that we're of that age where we can look at that, you know, like you say, what you we hate and, and, and find fr most frustrating. And I, I felt the same about Time Bandits when I was a kid and I watched it. I thought it was a cracking adventure sort of fantasy film I put I could sort of watch along with probably like Labyrinth or um, you know those sorts of sort of things where you do go back and you watch them and you can enjoy them in a certain aspect but there's still sort of gaping plot holes that now become a bit more of a stumbling block for your enjoyment um, and, and I think that is part of imagination and maybe you're right maybe we could we'll reconvene on this in 30 years <laughs> And we'll go back to Munchausen and be like, yeah, do you know what? Brazil, Brazil, it's just too, it's too old, it's too bitter. But Munchausen, it really speaks to me about, you know, being relevant and, and you know, uh, old age. Maybe. Yeah, I, I wonder, I, I wonder about that. Um, you know, and I wonder if, like, even, you know, even the ending, you know, as an old man, you know, I mean, maybe you revert to, like, oh, who cares about that, you know? <laughs> what, wasn't it, it, I mean, it's, you still have some of the tonal consistency that you sort of got from Brazil. You have some of the coherence. But, you know, those things that don't quite make sense, yeah, I'm willing to let go of kid, mm. you know, uh, watching stuff like Labyrinth or Dark Crystal or, you know. And, you know, like, you have maintained 100% uh, narrative coherence, you know. <laughs> It, 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 you know, your tastes and your perspectives change, and and maybe that will be the case. Um, that you, you know, I'd be interested to see what what you know older people do think of Barbara Munchausen. I mean, of the films, of the three of them, I think like you know, I mean, Gilliam's never been a um, a breakout success. He's never been a, you know like a mainstream, um, you know, never he's never been like a billion dollar kind of even like multi million dollar. Um, success story and I think sort of because I think each of these films maybe do speak to different people at different times it's 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 quite difficult to fit those hit those four quadrants as it were um and I think so that, well, I, no, and, and I but you know I mean I'm struck by how even the stuff that I don't like there's something that is worth seeing mm. you know I mean Time Bandits is, is interesting, uh, you know, if only as kind of like an artifact of the 80s and Python and, you know, I mean, Brazil is kind of, you know, a, a classic. Um, Munchausen has themes that I'm so glad I revisited, uh, you know, in preparation for this podcast that uh, I had just forgotten and that, you know, stick with me. Um you know, uh, that, uh, and, and themes and ideas that I like, mm. um, and, and maybe some of the flaws, you know, I mean, watching it as a whole, they, they sort of bother me, but they don't stick in my memory as well as the, the interesting stuff or the stuff that, uh, is visually stunning. And, and one thing about Gilliam is that he's always visually interesting. I mean, this guy can shoot a, uh, a, a Pepsi can and make it look like, it takes in the whole world, you know? Yeah. Oh, no, I have to admit, of, of, there are moments in each of these films which I find like jaw-droppingly beautiful or well shot or there's just... In every film, there's a scene or something like that is awesome. And it's, you know, the use of practical effects as well. Um, not to harp on, you know, about sort of the, the CGI is bad, I don't think that, but the set design, especially in sort of... Uh, you know Brazil and uh, and Baron Munchausen, the set design and the practical effects and the, like the miniatures and that sort of thing. I just love watching that thing. I just love watching the idea. So like you said that the sort of the, the idea of the, when they land on the moon and on in the ship and sort of um, gliding through the wet sand and then just the design of the the fake town or the fake city and then um the Sultan's Palace, everything. I just think it looks so good. I just really enjoy that element of it. It's just so um, des you know, it's designed to be a fantasy, and it looks the part. And the same with Brazil. It just there's no element that isn't isn't designed. You know what I mean? It's like nothing's left um, to sort of go. Ah, it'll be good enough. It's it, it all it, it all looks brilliant, and it's all well thought out. 
Yeah, and, you know, they're clear choices. And, and you know, I mean, Gilliam is kind of famous for the, the, the wide-angle shot. And, mm. you know, even in, like, the, the Agamemnon stuff, you know, those, uh, those buildings, which look to me more like Sumerian than, uh, you know, Greek, but, you know, those buildings are amazing, and there's a giant crowd scene, and, <laughs> you know... That, that whole business with, uh, you know, stealing his, his gold. I mean, you know, the whole sort of uh, interior palace shot is, is great. And, you know, there's so much to recommend it, even when we, we think it and, and maybe the whole doesn't hold together for us. Um, and maybe that goes back to what you were saying about the sketch and, and, and letting things develop on set of, of just sort of... Uh, loving the shot, loving the scene, mm. and if there are problems that we have with, with Gilliam, it's that sort of like whether it comes together as a whole enough for us. Um, but there's no doubt that, you know, shot by shot, scene by scene, I mean, even the stuff that we object to in Time Bandit, um, you know, it's not that it's a bad scene in and of itself. Like you said, that would have been a perfectly adequate Python sketch, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, this, even the stuff in uh, Munchausen after the cut uh, at the end, you know, as a, like, uh, optional addendum to this, there's no problem with that. I mean, it's got some nice shots. It's got some nice ideas. Uh, I don't think it works with the whole, but it is fascinating and interesting and beautiful in its own regard. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, to, to wrap up then, I think really what we're saying is that... Uh, you, I would recommend to everyone as, as a you know, the, a, whether it be a Gilliam fan or as a film fan, to check out these three films. To really, you know, I think um, people talk about Time Bandits. A lot of people talk about Brazil. I don't think Munchausen gets talked about enough. Um, I think people should go recommend this because there is something great. There is something good in each of these films. But I, in my opinion, I think Brazil stands head and shoulders um, as the best of the three. No, I agree completely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, obviously, I mean, Brazil is up there, you know, with, uh, you know, sort of the best of uh, the best of cinema. I mean, mm-hmm. if you see one Gilliam movie, you know, it's got to be that because, you know, everybody talks about that and it is, you know, sort of masterful. Um, but I agree that Munchausen is kind of underrated and... Uh, you know, it is sad to me that uh, Gilliam doesn't get more credit. You know, that, I mean, as, as much as I've said a lot of critical things, um, you know, it, even his movies that I don't like are an experience mm. and, and have interesting things going on and beautiful shots. And Gilliam is so uncompromisingly Gilliam, you know, yes. yeah. that uh, knowing his work is, is just uh, uh, charming. I think that's the truth. Is sort of they say that, that, you know, these three stand up as a as a thematic trilogy. But there's so much more in his filmography that you could you know you can go and and watch and take stuff from. The, the, the guy's a true auteur. That like you say, he is unflinching in his vision for for good or bad. But at least you get that it's his vision, um, and I don't think he would ever regret. That that's the that's the final product, um, you know. If if he's successful in getting what he thinks is the what he wants out there, then whether it's received well or not, I think he would probably say that's well. That's still my vision. It's what I wanted to do. I'm an artist in that respect, um, and I've got to respect that. Oh, I agree. And cinema, you know, we've talked before. Cinema needs more of that. Um, mm. So you know, if anyone's listening who is. Uh, Bored with the uh, bored with the sort of like Hollywood big budget machine and how I, I, I read a review of uh, the man who killed Don Quixote who said you know I which I like far more than most reviewers but who said um, you know it's it's a marvelous antiseptic to um, uh, movies that seem to be written by algorithm <laughs> yes. and I think that applies to Gilliam's work as a whole. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's it's it's um, like, it's, like one of the things I mentioned before. Like these things happen; they keep you surprised. Like you know, 
you can these are films you can watch time and time again and you will probably take something different from each of them where you know I won't, I won't deny I love mainstream cinema I love a lot of big action films big blockbusters you know superhero films I love all that but like you say they are getting incredibly predictable and almost written by algorithms a great way of putting it um yeah and well, I, I, I do let me, think... let me end with one one anecdote about that um as uh as I was watching these uh rewatching these with my friend um I uh you know, we made it through like you know, Time Bandits and Brazil, and I thought, you know, I really want to see a Transformers movie. <laughs> you know, like I need to cleanse my palate. Uh, you know, like I've had to do some work, and you know, there are things I like and things I don't. I really need just something dumb with explosions and some cool, <laughs> a few cool ideas. And, and then I'll watch one of those, and I'll say, you know, I really need a Terry Gilliam movie. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's funny it's it's um uh, i was reading a review i went to see pet cemetery the, the new pet cemetery recently and it's it it's fine but there's, there's someone related in uh to an anecdote of uh, stephen king and you know his sort of self-acknowledgement he said well i'm the i am the big mac of literature mm. yeah, in an acknowledgement of like well i'm fast food i'm, I'm I, and i know my place is i'm not you know and that's sort of like you say you go and watch a transformers film where you can go read a stephen king book but then you're going to want to go and try something that's going to challenge you. And I think that's what these can do, is they can challenge yeah, you and I, they can make you think. Well, thank you so much, Scott. This has been a joy. And I learned about these movies talking with you. So, you know, I'm always glad to, uh, you know, talk with you and, and, you know, bounce ideas off. And, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's surprising to me how, how eye to eye we saw. But, uh, you know, I still just... Uh, you know, I'm got that our observation about the billboards and sort of how they hide the ugly reality. Uh, you know, really struck me, uh, and I know I'll keep thinking about what you shared today. Well, no, I, I always appreciate you coming on, Julian. It's, it's always a great conversation. This has been a bit, this has been an epic one, um, mm. and it, it's it's so good, to sort of like I say, because you know these films. Uh, there are many, there are many sort of reviews and, and discussions of, like, say, mainstream films. I thought this would, these are a good, these are a good lot to bump, jump into. And I think, I think your point of view has been a fantastic contribution. So thank you again for being on the show. My pleasure, and I hope everyone checks out your Patreon and supports and subscribes. I really uh, encourage them to do so and love what you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's a flashback in time to me and Julian way back when uh, talking about Brazil and the adventures of Baron Munchausen. I hope you've enjoyed that. It's been a little soiree. We won't be having any more of those. I don't think there's not much there's left. But we are going to be moving forward. So in the next episode, uh, we're jumping uh, into the future uh, and back in time. We're going to be talking 12 Monkeys, Bruce Willis, Brad Pitt, uh, the 1995 uh, film. So... You know, check that out, that'd be fantastic but if you enjoy what we're doing, you like what we're doing go on to your podcast catcher, whatever it is uh, and leave a review, 4 stars, 5 stars any feedback is greatly appreciated we appreciate it and enjoy it all uh, but if you really, really enjoy what we're doing go and check out our Patreon page uh, we have a Patreon that supports all kinds of different pieces it's uh, patreon.com forward slash 20cg media that's 20th Century Geek Media 20cg media, there'll be a link down below in the podcast notes uh, and on there we have all kinds of things a whole host of other podcasts uh, julian and i do another podcast called trekking through the twilight zone in which we go episode by episode through the twilight zone uh, it's been a great fun uh other than that um go check out a whole bunch of other stuff uh, and i look forward to speaking to you on the next episode <laughs> <laughs>